All right, so thank you for joining me today. I'm going to be talking about meeting the health professions review family, uh, essentially talking about evidence synthesis. I've been working in evidence synthesis for a little while now, so I'm hoping I can give you some insight and some fresh new tools that maybe you haven't heard of before. I'm the Research Impact and Health Professions Librarian at the Cook Library of Towson University. And uh, today we'll be talking about why do we do literature reviews in the health profession? Professions, I feel like they have a little bit more weight in the health professions than they might in other fields. And an overview of review typologies. I'll focus a little bit on systematic reviews and scoping reviews. And then I'll talk about some of the review tools that we have available to you through Towson or just generally available because they're free. I have enabled captioning if you're wanting to use it, um, it should be available to you. So why do we do literature reviews in the health professions? To identify existing knowledge and to evaluate the existing evidence, to also synthesize that evidence, which will help us to inform decision-making, policy, and practice through patient care. And if you're an author, then to contribute to the existing knowledge with, with your own contribution. The literature reviews in the health professions can help to improve decision making, improve outcomes for patients, reduce bias in healthcare, lead to care efficiency as far as like tools and devices and um, um, equipment goes, and also quality improvement. So maybe this is nothing new to you, but that's why I think these are important. And it's also important that they're done well because they're going to have real outcomes and real impact. Now, here's an evidence-based medicine pyramid you've probably seen a lot, and I'm not saying I necessarily agree with this. Um, evidence-based medicine has been evolving over time, so different versions of this pyramid exist, but we have seen that systematic reviews are often at the top of an evidence-based medicine pyramid, meaning that they're a high level of evidence because they synthesize the results of multiple trials. And if they synthesize the results of multiple clinical trials, well, then they carry a little bit of weight. So that's a familiar evidence-based medicine pyramid that I think's kind of been evolving and we're seeing a move away from this. But we still, you know, when we, when we teach students EBM, we talk about these types of reviews being considered a high level of evidence. So it's really important to understand like what's going on behind the review. There's a lot of publications out recently that kind of discuss the quality of literature reviews, of systematic reviews right now, the state of the science in systematic reviews. And these all pretty much say the same thing, which is that they're poorly reported and not reproducible. And as a librarian, I would encourage you, if you are going to be working on on a systematic or scoping review that you involve not only yourself as a subject matter expert and maybe a statist statistical expert, but also a searching expert like a librarian and maybe even a consult with a statistician. And then also just be aware of the, the guidance that's out there. There's plenty of guidance for conduct, conduct and there's lots of guidance for reporting. So that exists and I'm gonna show you where to find it. And I don't expect you to read these articles, but I just want you to see that they're all kind of saying the same thing. They're poorly reported, inconsistent, and not reproducible. Let's talk about different review typologies. So these different typologies have different scope, different goals, depending on your topic and your ultimate hope for the review. We have narrative reviews, which have been around for a very long time. They have no specific set of standards, and there's a lot of flexibility in the way that you conduct them. And that's what we've seen historically. And then we have systematic reviews, which can have a meta-analysis or not. So those systematic reviews typically have looked at the effectiveness of an intervention or a treatment, and then they synthesize the results of multiple studies. And with that meta-analysis, they can make a recommendation on the effectiveness of a treatment. We are seeing systematic reviews turning into more than just a review of effectiveness. We're seeing other types of reviews. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. We see scoping reviews, which are meant to scope the field of literature and see what kind of evidence exists, 
what's been done in the past and what could happen in the future with this evidence, integrative reviews, which are a bit more of a clinical summary in some cases, rapid reviews, which may skip a step of a systematic review, not necessarily to make it easier, but just to get the evidence out faster. We definitely saw an uptick of rapid reviews during COVID when there was an urgency to get the evidence out quicker. And then umbrella reviews, which, which are even more complicated because they take the results of the systematic reviews and synthesize that together. So an umbrella review is a review of reviews. So these are just some of the types of review typologies that we see in the health professions. Certainly not a complete list, but sort of a categorical approach to these types of reviews. So here are four articles that I really like. Now, they're not the only four articles that exist about review typologies, but they're four of my favorites. And we see 2020, 2009, 2018, and 2019. Well, this one from 2009 has actually stood the test of time. These all attempted to look at review typologies that were coming out and offer some sort of standardization to the family of review types. So let's take a look at what these articles have to say. This is the ACL et al. article, which is the Future of Evidence Ecosystem Series Evidence Synthesis 2.0, when systematic scoping, rapid living, and overviews of reviews come together. And what I really like about these publications is they've all created some sort of table to synthesize those types of reviews. So they talk about scoping reviews, um, their main features, maybe some of the shortfalls of this review type. We have systematic maps, rapid reviews, updates of a systematic review, living reviews, which are meant, another thing that came out during COVID, I think, really to um, like not say this is our final publication and that's that, but to continually update a publication so that the best evidence is always being considered. And then an overview of reviews. So we, we can see some of this here. And if you have like a specific question in mind, these tables might help when you're trying to decide. This is from the Grant and Booth article. That's the 2009 article. They looked at a bunch of different published reviews coming out in healthcare, and they attempted to characterize them. So we have critical reviews, literature review, like a narrative literature review, mapping review or systematic map, meta-analysis, mixed methods, an overview of reviews, a qualitative systematic review, and there are actually more. I just wanted to show you an example of the kinds of things they've mentioned here. One of the things that Grant and Booth mentions in their publication is, and I'll talk about this too, systematic reviews are really tough as a classroom project. If you're assigning your students systematic reviews, you might wanna rethink that because they generally take a team and time, lots and lots of time, more than a semester. And so the Grant and Booth article sets out a framework for what they call a systematized review, which might be more appropriate for a student project. It's, it's really tough to have students do a systematic review in a semester, especially on their own. This is the MUN article, and this is talking about the different types of systematic reviews. So they talk about reviews of effectiveness, which were, were the traditional type of systematic review in medicine and the health professions, but they also address qualitative reviews, reviews of costs and economic evaluation, reviews of incidence and prevalence, of diagnostic test accuracy, etiology and risk, expert opinion and policy, psychometrics, prognostic, and methodologies. Now this team is a team out of Adelaide, Australia, and the JBI um, organization, which is an evidence-based medicine organization. And what I really like about what they're doing is not only have they given you the review types and the reasons why you would choose that review type, but here they've given you some question formats. So if you work in nursing, you're probably really familiar with PICO, population, intervention, comparator, outcomes. But for each of these other types of systematic reviews, they've given you sort of a framework. So etiology and risk, your question would have a population an exposure like um, cigarette smoke or lead, you know, things like that. 
and an outcome. And then they've even given you some question examples here. So this is one of my favorite articles. The last one I'll talk about is this Sutton et al. article. Excuse me. So they again, they just, and, and there's a lot of overlap. Like a lot of these are saying pretty much the same thing. There's a little bit of difference. If you really want to dig in, I highly recommend reading the articles. You'll see they even cite each other here. So they've given you another breakdown of, of expert reviews in the health professions. So I'm going to, um, of course, make sure you have these slides so that you can read these articles on your own time. But I do want to talk about some of the things that you would consider when you're choosing a health professions review and some of the work that's being done around this in this field that's constantly evolving. So the folks, again, at JBI in Australia, they have something called an Evidence Synthesis Taxonomy Initiative. Their goal is to help the researcher choose the right review for the right reasons, with the right methods, for the right question. So that's one of their, I'm quoting them, the right review for the right question at the right time, with the right reasons. And you can read more about that taxonomy initiative here. And they've identified many, many different types of evidence synthesis coming out. You might see a systematic scoping review or a scoping systematic review or a scoping gap map review. Uh, so you can read more about that here. I think it's a really great tool. And they're going to link you up with some additional resources, which I'll talk about too. Let's talk about those systematic reviews. So if you plan to do a systematic review, you probably have a question that has something to do with interventions or effectiveness, diagnostic test accuracy, incidence or prevalence, etiology or risk. Maybe you have qualitative data, economic evidence, equity, patient reported outcomes, or adverse effects. And there's lots of guidance on this, so you don't have to go just off of this information alone. There's the JBI Evidence Synthesis Manual. Let me see if I can open that up for us. And the Cochrane Handbook. And you might say to yourself, well, I'm not doing a Cochrane review and I'm not doing a JBI review. These handbooks exist to guide you whether or not you're doing a review for Cochrane or JBI, which you probably aren't, and that's fine. These are still um, conduct guidance for systematic reviews. So let me show you the Cochrane Handbook. Cochrane is a big organization out of the UK. They've been around since the 70s. They've been working to improve the methodological rigor of systematic reviews. So if you're not doing a Cochrane review, I, you don't really have to worry about the Cochrane reviews part. But here's where they talk about the methods. Why would you do a review? Determining the scope and questions, setting your inclusion and exclusion criteria, and then searching and selecting studies. And I'll just point out, I'm a little biased. I hope you can forgive me for that. But they do recommend working with a librarian. And they give you some tips about where to search and how to search. Then they talk about risk of bias, effect measures, collecting the data, and creating your summary of findings. They have other types of reviews here. I've mentioned equity, qualitative, economic evidence, and reviews that might not have randomized controlled trials. Of course, there are going to be topics out there that don't have RCTs, and so they talk about how to address that when you're doing a review. Um, and it's all free online, so it's one of my favorite resources. I keep bookmarked for myself. And then conversely, the JBI, they're kind of doing similar things. And over here on the left, they've just updated their manual for evidence synthesis. This is the 2024 edition. Over here on the left, you can see um, methodological considerations for evidence synthesis. They talk about qualitative effectiveness, expert opinion and policy, economic evidence, etiology risk, mixed methods, umbrella, Scoping reviews. So that's that's not a lesser systematic review. It's a different kind of review. We're going to talk about those in just a moment. But I'll point out that they have an entire chapter for scoping reviews. And they are considered some of the leaders in this field. So if, you, if you're like, well, I think I'd like to do a, a scoping review, absolutely check out uh, chapter 10 of the JBI Evidence Synthesis Manual. And what I like about these all is that they link you out to other evidence. They're not like competing with each other. It's not like JBI says we're better than Cochrane, Cochrane's better than JBI. No, they're all working together to improve the state 
of evidence synthesis. So that's another great resource. Uh, if you're doing something in social science, let's say you're not strictly in the health professions, then the Campbell collaboration is seen as the expert guidance for um, expert reviews, systematic reviews, and the social sciences. And it's very similar. Let's go down to the table of contents. They're going to walk you through the methodological standards and then talk about how to conduct the review as far as naming it, making a protocol, doing your inclusion and exclusion criteria, conducting the search, risk of bias, um, publishing. So that's, that's a big one there. And they also have a website. I usually just Google Campbell Collaboration. I spelled it wrong, but hopefully I'll get it. There it is. And so they are doing methods in the social sciences. Let me drop that in the chat. So I'm hitting you with a lot of resources today, but my hope is that you'll say, oh, I didn't know this existed. I'm going to bookmark it. I'm going to read it when I'm ready to do my review. Let's see. That was EndNote that you just saw. Okay. So there's conduct guidance for, for systematic reviews. And I, as I mentioned, JBI... Cochrane Handbook and the Campbell Collaboration are the big three. There are some others depending on your discipline. So that's conduct guidance, but there's reporting guidance as well. And I wanna talk about this, the PRISMA statement. If you've worked in the health professions, you probably have heard of the PRISMA statement and the PRISMA statement just got a facelift. So this website used to look a lot different and this is the new look. So in 2020, they updated a checklist that talks about how you should report your systematic review. And let me see if I can open it here. I think it's 26 items. Let's see, why is it so slow? Let's see, 27 items. Let me make it a little bit bigger. So the PRISMA 2020 checklist, PRISMA standing for the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analyses. There's a whole publication, there's a guidance document, but this is the checklist so that if you have decided to do a systematic review, you're going to say, okay, I need to fulfill these criteria. And this is going to help you to see where you reported it. So your title, of course, you're going to report that. Uh, your abstract, you're going to have one. And then you're going to just note that, yes, you have eligibility criteria You've documented your information sources. Where are you going to be searching? Where do you plan to search? Do you have your search strategy that's required now? You can't just say we search in databases and that's that. You have to provide the search strategy. And the selection process by which they mean title and abstract screening, full text screening. How did you extract the data? How did you conduct the risk of bias? What were your effect measures and your synthesis methods? I'll just scroll down to the bottom. And the results of your syntheses, then they have a section for discussion and other information regarding your review. So this is a really great resource. And as far as I understand, you don't have to report all 27 items per se, but you have to report all the ones that apply to your research. Now, the, the excellent thing about the PRISMA um, statement, checklist, et cetera, is that they have extensions. So let's take a look at those extensions. And I, you'll be surprised by some of the extensions they have. A couple will be way more useful than others. So they have an extension for abstracts. And if you're writing a systematic review abstract, of course, it's going to depend on where you're submitting that, what journal, what the journal requirements are. But these are the basic things that they would want you to cover in the abstract. There's 12 items here. They have a reporting checklist for diagnostic test accuracy. They have a checklist for protocols, which is required of systematic reviews. So here's a PDF checklist for the protocol. You're going to have the title. You're going to have the authors and their affiliations and give the rationale for doing this review. And you're going to document some of the things that you plan to do. So they call it an a priori protocol. And then my favorite part of the PRISMA extensions, well, they have PRISMA for scoping reviews if you're doing a scoping review, 
And then the Prisma search extension, this is new in 2020. A lot of editors, different journals are adhering to this. So if you do plan to submit, just keep in mind, you're going to have to document some things, which will come up in just a moment. These are, this was written by methodologists and by librarians. 16 items, and it'll document your, can't make it any bigger, sorry, your databases, your search strategies, your study registries, where else you searched. If you conducted citation searching, contacted the authors, used other methods, your search strategies with limits and restrictions, any filters, updates, dates, peer review of the search strategy, and managing your records. This is where a librarian might be able to help you a little bit. So there's lots of reporting guidelines for different types of reviews that exist and mostly can be found on Prisma Statement. Of course, other disciplines have other, other reporting guidelines, but this is pretty general in terms of best practice. So I, as I mentioned, systematic reviews, they require a team that all the uh, existing guidance, Cochrane, JBI, Campbell, all require at least two authors. They take over a year on average. So this Bora article from 2017 and BMJ Open did an analysis of the time and workers needed to complete a systematic review of medical interventions. And they found that on average, the review took 67.3 weeks. So much longer than a semester semester. It requires search and statistical experts and often requires specialized screening software, which I'll talk about at the end. There, there's free uh, specialized screening software. So instead of a systematic review for your students, you might consider having them write a protocol, which is going to be, I promise, just as, just as um, challenging. You know, they have to come up with a question. They have to come up with inclusion and exclusion criteria write the protocol. You could use the Prisma P extension for the protocol. You could have them document a thorough and comprehensive search. Where do they plan to search and how? You could have them screen a set of records based on inclusion and exclusion criteria for a specific question. You could have them write a method section. So there's a lot you could do with your students that wouldn't be a full systematic review. Or as Andrew Booth and Grant mentioned in their 2009 article, you might consider the uh, systematized review, which would allow them to do it within a semester with good practices in place. So now let's talk about scoping reviews, which have a different goal than a systematic review. This is from a MUN article in 2018. Systematic review or scoping review, guidance for authors when choosing between them. Scoping reviews are an ideal tool to determine the scope or coverage of a body of literature on a topic and give a clear indication of the volume of evidence and studies available, as well as an overview of its focus. So I think there's been a misunderstanding in the past that, oh, like I can't do a systematic review, I'll just do a scoping review instead. But they're not a lesser review, they're an entirely different kind of review where you might say, this is a new or emerging field. We don't really know what's been done here yet, or we're not sure, there's not a ton of evidence. So you would take a look at the evidence you would categorize it and thematically analyze it that way. So scope reviews aren't really looking at interventions. They're looking at a field in a much more general sense. There's scoping review guidance. So in 2005, two authors, Arc and O'Malley, set up a framework for um, scoping reviews. And it's actually really straightforward and not all that difficult. So let me see if I can get access to it today. Um, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Let me drop this in the um, in the Towson website and see if I can get to it. So I'm going to go to the library's website. I'm just going to drop it here and cook one search and see if we can get access to this framework. I think it's five steps. Here it is. So if all else fails, you can always go to the library. So I've actually worked with a couple of faculty people at Towson who have used this framework 
it's not that out of date. It's it's still great. And so let's go down. It talks about why you would do the scoping study. And then it gives a framework with five stages, identifying the research question, identifying the relevant studies, selecting relevant studies, charting the data, collating, summarizing, and reporting the results. And then there's more context given for each stage. So I find this very useful. As I said, I've worked with faculty who have used this framework. As I mentioned, the JBI Evidence Synthesis Manual Chapter 10 is an entire chapter on scoping reviews, why you would do them, how you would do them, citing to all the best evidence and guidance for these types of reviews. And then the Prisma Extension for Scoping Reviews, which we didn't look at just yet, but let's see if we can get that. So there's the Prisma, that's Preferred Reporting Items for Scoping Reviews. Um, I'm just going to go back to the Prisma checklist here, Prisma extensions. And this is the checklist for scoping reviews. So as you fill these out, you, you it's a fillable form, and you'd be able to make sure that you addressed all the elements of a scoping review. 22 items, not too overwhelming. So that's some of the best available guidance on scoping reviews. And if you want to see sort of a comparison, I adapted this from the article, Systematic Review or Scoping Review, Guidance for Authors When Choosing Between Them. And so they've said, you don't need any of this for a narrative review, but for scoping and systematic, you're going to want to consider that a priori protocol and protocol registration. For systematic reviews, people typically register in a tool called Prospero. And for scoping reviews, they typically register in the Open Science Framework, where you could use your institutional repository. At Towson, we have ScholarWorks. They are going to require a peer-reviewed search strategy, both scoping and systematic, with standardized data extraction forms, mandatory critical appraisal, risk of bias, and a synthesis of findings and summary of findings. So in scoping, you're not going to get that because you're not looking at an, at an intervention per se. And for scoping, that critical appraisal step and the protocol registration step are optional. But for systematic, all the available guidance says that this is required. Now, does that mean things get published without these? Absolutely, they do. That's just how it's been. So let's look, look at some review tools and resources. We have a lot. So we have two guides at Towson. One is planning for your expert literature review. And I'll show you that first. I'm going to drop a link in the chat. It's pretty much got everything we talked about today. So here are those four articles on review typologies. If you're wanting to get to those and link to those. On the left, you'll see guidance for systematic. I'm trying to make this a little bigger. Guidance for scoping. Guidance for Integrative, Rapid, Realist, and Umbrella. Links to the standards and guidelines, which are going to have the Cochrane Handbook and some of the other things. Here's the Prisma statements. Oops, I might need to update those because Prisma just did a complete facelift. Yeah, I'll make sure these are updated. Um, even some guidance for where to publish. We have some tools available for that. And then I have a link to screening tools and software, which we'll talk about next. So this is the guide. When you're planning, what kind of review do I want to do? How do I do it? What's my time frame? Who are my team members? And what's going to be involved? The other one we have is searching for evidence in the health professions. If you've been in the health professions for a while, you've heard of PubMed, you've heard of Medline, you've heard of Embase and the Cochrane Library. These are all recommended databases for searching for health and medicine topics. Of course, if you have other, other topics, then uh, you know if you're doing something about mental health or well-being, we have psych info. If you're doing something about nursing or audiology or occupational therapy, then we have CINAHL. And so this is going to help you find where to search and why, and how to conduct a good search that's documented, reproducible, and transparent. So my favorite section here is 
document your searches where I have some templates. So I'm gonna scroll down. I go through some basic literature searching techniques, but at the bottom, I have a, a Word document on how to document your searches. So you might find this helpful for yourself or for your students. Let's see if I can get it to work. So what's the class? What's the date? What's your topic? And what are your search terms? Where did you search? When did you search? What terms did you use? How many results did you get? Did you say English, peer review? Did you say 20, 2020 to 2024? Any of those limits that you get to apply needs to be reported here. So that's one of the templates for reporting your search strategy. Some people really like to do this in Excel. So I created an Excel document as well. So this will tell you same thing, just in a different format. So you might see this in the appendix of a published search uh, systematic review. You'll probably see that. I'll put a link in the chat. It's tough to it's tough to understand how to capture your reviews, but once you get some practice. So those are the two Towson guides we have: planning for your review and searching for the evidence. And then some of those question frameworks I mentioned. So as I mentioned, PICO for intervention. PCC, Population Concept Context for Scoping Reviews, Cocoa Pop, which is funny, uh, reminds me of the breakfast cereal, Cocoa Puffs, Condition, Context, Population for Incidence and Prevalence Reviews, PEO, Population, Exposure of Interest and Outcome for Etiology and Risk, PERD, Population Index Test, Reference Test, Diagnosis of Interest, if you're looking at a specific diagnostic test. And I know that sometimes people are looking at diagnostic tests. Okay, two really awesome tools, one of which is the Cornell Review Tree. It's just a PDF. So let's take a look at it and I'll drop a link in the chat. And now I have 100 windows open. There we go. So this is going to guide you through choosing the right review for you. Do you wanna gather all the evidence on a particular research topic Yes, or no, not really, don't have the time for that. That's okay, you just have to decide going into it. Do you have 12 to 18 months to complete a review? Yes or no? Do you have a broad topic or multiple research questions? Do you want to review other published systematic reviews on your topic? Well, then an umbrella review or a review of reviews might be the right question type. Do you have a well-formulated research question? Yes or no? And are you going to use statistical methods? Then maybe you'll have a meta-analysis. So that's just a little decision tree. And then the second page takes you uh, kind of to that evidence, tells you what to consider. If that's the type of review you'll be planning. My other favorite tool is the Write Review tool. This is new since 2022. And we'll actually walk through an example here. All right, so you're saying to yourself, I'd like to write a review and it's going to be quantitative. Okay, let's check quantitative. And then you have to answer five questions. What is your goal or objective? If your review is about interventions, how many? What type of evidence, primary studies or systematic reviews? What type of analysis? Do you have time or cost constraints? So it's only those five questions. Let's say we're going to do an effectiveness review on two interventions. We're going to look at primary studies only. We're going to do a quantitative synthesis. That's probably a meta-analysis. And let's just say, ideally, we have no constraints. We'll say submit. And here it is. And what I really like, Suggested methods, systematic review with meta-analysis if appropriate, but what's really super here is it's going to link you out to guidance. So after you view conduct, conduct and reporting guidance, look, we're going back to the Cochran Handbook, we're going back to JBI, we're going to the Center for Review, um, what's it called? The Center for Research Reviews and Dissemination, sorry, and the Campbell. So they're giving you like all kinds of guidance and reporting guidance. 
for this type of review. So write review tool is definitely one of my favorites. And then we do have some review tools we can point you to as librarians. Um, maybe you've used EndNote, Zotero, RefWorks, Mendeley. Well, we have entire guides for these tools. These are called citation management or records management. And we do have some videos. We have a lot of links. If you use Mendeley or Zotero, we have guides for those as well. EndNote's my favorite, but it does cost money. There's a free version too. Uh, but for systematic reviews, it works really well. So if we just go to EndNote, um, there's usually a student teacher discount. Just make sure you're looking for that. And once you buy it, then you have access to it um, in perpetuity. It's not like it goes away. So if, if you buy a note once, you'll have it until the next update, which you'll probably have to buy because that's just how they work. Um, so EndNote's my recommendation. Zotero is free and open source. So you could also use that one. And then there are screening tools for systematic reviews. So as I mentioned, systematic and scoping reviews, you're going to go through a screening process. First, the title and abstract, and then the full text. And people used to do this with Excel spreadsheets, but now there are tools that exist. So Covenants is pretty much the standard in the field. It's really, really great. It costs money, but there's a free trial. Um, and I've used it a lot. It's pretty amazing. And they have a really great resource bank. But the free there's a free one called Rayon. And um, they've updated, actually. So this video, I need to update. But they um, help you with the title and abstract screening and the full text screening. And it's free to use unless you want to do like 10 reviews. And then I think there's a little bit of a fee. So either one of these tools is great for the title abstract screening and the full text screening. Now, Covidence can take you on through to data extraction and risk of bias. That's the one tool that does that very well. Rayon is still getting there. They can do a little bit of data extraction and risk of bias. Typically, people are like creating their forms and filling out their forms. I'll just mention we do have Qualtrics available through Towson. That's That would be used for data capture. So if you wanted to find out more about these tools, you can contact me at the library. Um, there's also a really great tool out there from another group in Australia, um, Bond University. They have a whole suite of tools called the SR Accelerator. I'm gonna open up this SR Accelerator. So over here, you don't have to log in. You can use all of these tools right here on the website. So they do have a search function where if you created a search for one database, this is a PubMed syntax right here, then it's going to help you get syntax for other databases. Now I'll just mention you have to be careful because if you're familiar with medical subject headings, which we see up here in the top, these don't get translated. This is why you might want to work with a librarian. So it's basically just using a formula to feed this back to you, but it's not necessarily correct. So please be careful. But you can get multiple database searches here. For the most part, it really helps with syntax. They can help you do like a word analysis, so like a natural language processing. If you had like say five key articles, you're like, I need more articles like, th like these articles then you could upload your little file of articles here and it'll give you back a word analysis of those articles to help you create your search. Anytime we're creating a search, let's say in PubMed, in Embase, CINAHL, we're going to have duplicates. So this tool helps you take out those duplicates and that'll be really nice. And you don't have to look at each thing twice. And they also have a screenatron where you upload your library of results and you'll be able to screen them here. My favorite part about this suite of tools is the methods wizard. So let's say you've done the review, you've done the search, you've done the screening, you're ready to write things up. So over here on the left, we have a column and we're going to walk through each of these. You know, you have to name the review, you have to have outlined your inclusion and exclusion criteria, children, adults, people with Parkinson's, people who play pickleball, 
you know, that kind of thing. Interventions, comparator, outcomes. It'll have some questions for your search strategies, your study screening, data extraction, the risk of bias tool. And what's really nice is once you've gone through and filled this out, it's going to give you back a method section. And, and this is just one part of it, but at the end you'll get a full method section, which then you can generate the output. You can copy and paste this. You can edit it as needed for your own publication. So it's helping you adhere to these best practices in evidence synthesis by having you report on all the transparent, comprehensive things that you've done. So that's the methods wizard. And I think that might be it. I've thrown a ton of things at you today. Um, I hope you feel a little more empowered to choose the right review and to know that there are tools out there to help you and especially people out there to help you. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be around uh, for a while. And if not, then just reach out to me when you're ready. <laughs>